So I'm just about to commence my afternoon stalk now with uh, Graham from South Ayrshire Stalking. I went out with him this morning and we had a beautiful stalk. Got up at 3.50 a.m. and kind of just got ready. About 20 to 5 we left and met up with some other chaps in the village who were going to do a different stalk. So me and Graham and Ellie popped over to a really nice woodland coniferous plantation but absolutely stunning and really undulating terrain up overlooking the glen and the valley. Um, it's really beautiful and when we arrived we already heard a roebuck starting to call. So uh, yeah, it was an absolutely amazing experience and I cannot wait for this evening's stalk. So I'll catch up with you then. There might be a little bit less talking than usual in my videos but in the last stalk in the morning there's quite a lot of wind so I'll leave you with that then let's see how we got in tonight. With the open season for roebucks in Scotland ranging from the 1st of April to the 20th of October, I was slap bang in the middle, arriving in July right at the start of the rut, which was being held back by a colder front of weather impacting the temperature, which had recently been soaring into the mid 30s. But despite that, on the hilly lowland forest there were still signs of deer, kick started by a rustle and break of twigs to steady the aim towards and giving Graham, the guide I was out with, an opportunity to start calling. As soon as you hear a movement in the woods, it can be gone, and with the smaller, agile size of the rose species of deer, Capriolus capriolus, and their reddish grey-brown coat, they easily blend into their surroundings. The species is one of the two native deer to inhabit Scotland, and with a reduction in their natural habitat, combined with the commercial forestry dominating the landscape, and the resulting fear of damage to the newly planted crops, they do require careful population control and management from outfits like South Ayrshire Stalking, who manage many hectares of land throughout Scotland, including the piece that I was in now. Given the high wind swirling and the undulating terrain of the forestry land we were in, it made for a good opportunity to spot and stalk over the valleys and plantations. Walking briefly down the tracks in a single file to reduce our silhouettes and stopping once again to use our binoculars to glass the surrounding areas and scan for any evidence of movement, disturbances or deer themselves. That's why stalking has never just been about the taking of an animal to me, it's about the stalk the surroundings and getting in tune with them. Understanding how an animal moves with the weather and changes its behaviours accordingly is one of the benefits of hunting with a local guide. They intricately understand the local landscape and offer a window into the habits of the quarry unique to that habitat. This was something that the lucky hunter competition I've won had sorted out on my behalf and was already proving to be an invaluable asset in my deer stalking journey.
there's nothing better than an early morning walk. And even with the weight of a 243 rifle on my shoulder and the cold wind rushing past in all directions, it was great to be out and experiencing a lovely part of Scotland. I've always enjoyed going off the beaten path, so taking little individual stalks throughout the woodland gave really nice opportunities to discover different sites and see where different animals may be hiding. So many people ask me why, if I enjoy nature, do I stalk and prey on animals? I respect and have studied deer and the art of stalking for some time. I have faith in the process and the tools that I use and make sure that time is always taken finding the right animal. Hunting is tough and having the right gear, knowledge and physique are essential for stalks like this. Spending hours and hours walking, hiking, glassing. Hunting is a lifestyle misunderstood too often in a modern society, a place filled with its own pressures to conform to. When I step out, I switch on. My senses heighten and I can hear nature talking. And despite the ups and downs of anticipation combined with the disappointment of not seeing too much, it was overwhelmed with the awe and excitement granted by such a beautiful landscape. Ayrshire hosts some incredible vistas and this particular location didn't let it down even if the deer were bedded up on this particular cold morning. Being in such dense forestry land, there were so many avenues that deer could be hiding, and given the weather, they definitely were doing just that. They act very much like us. We wouldn't want to be out in the cold. Of course, we are because we're out hunting, but the deer are trying to preserve energy and will often wait until later in the day to feed if the weather isn't suiting them in the morning. This meant for lots of stops and stalks, looking for any opportunity to call out any wary bucks. But all of that waiting, patience and discipline pays off when you spot a deer. Graham's keen eye was straight away drawn to the reddish hue of the roe deer hiding behind a willow, a stretch away over a shallow valley. We made for a quick descent and ascended again to try and get a good vantage point, ensuring that the wind was to our face, which was quite hard considering it was swirling, but nevertheless, the adrenaline was absolutely pumping.
and I can't describe the anticipation when you're starting to close in on an animal that you've seen. Not only the questions running through your mind of, is it a buck, is it a doe? Often you lose sight of your prey, so you have to keep a mental picture of where it was. And losing your bearings in places like this is all too easy, which is again where Graham came into his own. It seems to always be the case that you only see does when you're out after bucks, and you only see bucks when you're out after does. But despite this particular deer being a doe, there was still a good chance of a buck being nearby. And following with a careful eye is always worth the effort. And even if that particular opportunity doesn't pull through, there's always other opportunities. Sometimes dashing before your eyes into the forest never to be seen again. But that's just one of the thrills of hunting that you can't buy, you can't fake, you just get when you're out. It's a time and a place thing, and what a place to be, and in such great company. Despite the morning stalk being unsuccessful in terms of taking a shot, I'd had an amazing time learning and getting to know Graham, and with Ellie filming it, it had taken a great weight off of my shoulders and given me the opportunity to be fully immersed. Leaving the hills and the forestry land behind, we head back to Gary Loop, where we caught up with Chris Dalton, who was harvesting some home produce before we went to rest up for the evening stalk ahead. Despite having an unsuccessful trip in the morning, I was raring to go, and even after having been up early and not having much rest since the bushcraft show, we hit the road with Graham again to explore another woodland located a short distance away. So we just arrived at another spot now, really nice valley. Range is starting to come in, so we're gonna go and have a look, see what we can find. It had rained since the morning's outing, so I was wearing my Stone Creek chaps so as not to get soaked in the long grass. And speaking of long grass, it's a bane to those out stalking. At this height, you could have easily hidden a whole herd of roe deer feet away, and I may not have even noticed. But again, that's part of the thrill, maybe stumbling upon something you don't expect. Quite a lot of rutting activity. That flattened area of grass that we just showed you. I'm just gonna take a steady stalk up. This beautiful landscape hosted a coniferous forest to our right and a newly planted hardwood area of forest on the left hand side over a distinct valley with a small burn travelling all the way through it. It was so scenic and serene and you could understand in whole why there would be deer here. This is the perfect environment giving them a good avenue to move between both types of forest. So this sat on top of this 
Graham crawling towards me through the undergrowth to signal that he'd spotted something, I followed him to the adjoining field where I saw a beautiful red stag. And although I wasn't up in Scotland to stalk red deer, an opportunity at a young six-pointer whilst in season and with permission was not one to miss. But I did. Now I like to think that it's fate. Having won a competition for roe deer, it seemed fitting to only take that species. And also, personally ticking off the species in size order, it seemed right to have left this incredible stag get away. The sheer magnificence when looking down the sight surely impacted my shot, dipping just below the deer, but it made for a clean miss. Something any hunter would pray for given the circumstances. This would be hard ground to track an injured stag on. What people tend to do is lift, so they shoot underneath. Well, we're not the front of the side now. Yeah. Ash tree there, not too tree there. I'm not looking for that tree. It's a good listen. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Although the miss was still in the back of my head, this still didn't put me off. My skills were not in doubt, and I only had a slightly rushed opportunity behind me. So we pushed on towards a fenced plantation, which was re-establishing the more traditional species found in Scotland's rainforests. This was a hardwood, grant-funded plantation in between the two forests that we'd been working in, and this required careful protection, as when we were passing by, we had spotted a buck. It hosts a far greater spacing between trees and shrubs, which allow for mosses and lichens to proliferate, something ever rarer in the surrounding areas and lovely to see making a return. Deer in a fenced off location can be a detriment to such environments, quickly overpopulating the space and damaging new growth. This in turn calls for the management of these animals who are often far more in tune to the fenced area than one would think. Knowing every detail intricately, you really become aware that you are in their territory. With the barks of a roe deer rushing in, it was time to steady the sticks and take aim. There's a tendency for roe to charge directly at a well-placed call in the rut, so a keen eye is always needed.
With no availing companion to the doe we had spotted and the light drawing in, it was time to make a wet but content descent towards the vehicle to finish the trip. And although the hunt didn't return any rewards in terms of meat or animals culled, the reward was in the time spent with Ellie and Graham, exploring what is an astoundingly beautiful landscape, filled with such beautiful views. It's hard to think that most of England once looked like this and also hosted our ancestors, sharing the exact same struggle of the hunt for their prey. Hunting is about accepting the cycle of life, embodying the principles of a discipline to deliver a clean kill to your prey with no suffering and to also be content with its absence. And this trip reminded me that all things come to those who wait. So you should be doing it there. So safety forward. Safety forward bolt. Is it in? Yeah. At the front, is it? Yeah. Empty. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah. that's rock and roll. Just top right in that. Yeah. So just finished the evening stalk. Um, had one shot at a really nice red buck, but missed um, as is tradition. Uh, but we're looking forward to tomorrow morning. So fingers crossed. We'll see you then. Join me next time when I turn the cards for a lucky hunt. <laughs>